Michael Blue. Um, I'm a recovering elder at this church. It is, uh, thank you, yes. It is good to be here. I, uh, I am formerly an elder, currently serving as a deacon, and it is always a distinct pleasure to get to uh, bring God's word to you this morning. Uh, as we've talked about already, today is Palm Sunday, and what we remember on Palm Sunday is Jesus' entry into Jerusalem a week before his death. And, and the event, the donkey symbolized peace that he rode in on. And the, the palms represented victory and triumph. And so this event is symbolic of the peaceful establishment of Jesus's kingdom through his victory over sin and death on the cross. And what we get to look at this morning is a miracle that points to that reality. We're gonna look at John chapter nine. So I'd invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles and turn uh, there. But in this chapter, we see Jesus restoring the sight of a man born blind. And what this miracle is symbolic of is it's symbolic of us receiving spiritual sight, which allows us to see our need for a savior to overcome sin and death. And so the way I like to think about it is, is this miracle gives us the eyes to see the Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey as the one who saves us. So as I already invited you to do we're going to be in John chapter 9, so open your Bibles. We're going to be covering the whole chapter this morning, all 41 verses, so buckle your seatbelts. You may be thinking this is a lot to cover in one morning, and it is. I was, as I was preparing, I looked at two of the most famous or well-known expositional preachers, John MacArthur and John Piper, and it took them each three sermons to cover this material. So Phil either believes I am just that much more astute than these gentlemen, or I can only find about a third of what they found in the passage. I'm going to probably go with the latter on that one. So here's where we are. At the end of chapter 8, Jesus is leaving the temple. They're seeking to stone him because he claimed to be God. As he's walking out, leaving this place, he sees a blind man sitting on the side of the temple, at the temple gates, and he heals him. After this man is healed, we're going to see him interact with a number of different groups of people as they try to figure out how he got healed and then what that healing says about the one who healed him. And then finally, after this man is ultimately rejected, we're going to see Jesus come and reveal himself to him. So let's get going. In verse 1, it says this. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Two things to know about this man. One, he was born blind. This isn't a temporary blindness. This isn't something that just happened to him. He was born this way. And second, we're going to learn later in verse 8 that this man is a beggar. He's sitting at the temple gates begging. This man is in an extremely vulnerable position. He can't work because he can't see to work. And so he's placed at the gates of the temple as a beggar. His parents have abandoned him. He has parents, we'll learn, that are alive. And yet he still has to sit and beg at the temple gates. And so he is entirely dependent on other people's charity in order to survive. And so as Jesus and the disciples pass by, it says this. It says, as his, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is a rather cold question. I mean, imagine the scene. You're walking by this blind beggar and they stop, not to help him, but to ask a theological question about why he's in this situation. All right, this is kind of cold. It's not like this guy's deaf as well. He's blind. He can hear every word that they're saying about him. They're treating him like a cadaver would be treated in medical school. But here's the theological uh, question, the problem that they're, they're wrestling with. This theological problem they're wrestling with is that suffering always is because of punishment for sin. So that's why they're asking, who sinned that this man had to be born Blind. And so this caused a really unique problem for them when somebody was born with a disability. If they had to ascribe all suffering to sin, that means when someone's born blind, you have to blame somebody for sinning for them to be blind. And so they had come up with a couple of ways to do this. First of all, they didn't want to, be, they didn't want to blame God. 
So they had to come up with this way around. And the first way they did this is they would say that the person sinned in the womb. They would look at Jacob and Esau and say, well, clearly Esau sinned in the womb because he was punished later on. So that had to be the result. A little bit of a stretch. But the main way that they did this is they would blame the suffering and disability on the sin of the parents and the grandparents and the great grandparents. And they got this out of Exodus. In Exodus, it says that the sins of the father or the sins are visited on the third and fourth generation. Okay, so they would look at this and say, well, clearly the parents or grandparents sinned. That's why this person is suffering. But this all, both of these were misinterpretations of scripture because we have to read scripture in light of the whole thing. And we see in Job, a man who suffers through no fault of his own. We see in Ezekiel where God says, no, that's not, the, that's not the way it works. Individuals are responsible for their own sin. This had a much different idea. This was more saying the sins of, of the parents and grandparents and great grandparents are so significant that it can take generations to root them out. So there are consequences to them, but they're not a direct result of suffering. So sin, really the way they look at it, the way we need to think about this is sin is always ultimately the cause of suffering in the world. And that's because of the sin, original sin that happened in the garden. So sin as a blanket idea is responsible for all suffering that we see in the world. But individual suffering is not always the result of a person's sin. And I think that's really important for us to understand this morning. And so Jesus gives us this answer as well. It says, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus immediately shifts from a place of judgment to one of grace. He says, let's look beyond the reason why he's suffering and see how glory can come to God through it. I think what Jesus is saying and showing us here is I'm not having to respond to this man's sin. In all of this, I'm planning on how to use him to display my glory and the glory of my father. Um, John Piper says it this way, and, and this is, I think this is really encouraging for us. He says, the implication of this, Jesus' statement for your life is profound. No matter what mess you're in or what pain you're in, the causes of that mess and that pain are not decisive in explaining it. What is decisive in explaining it is God's purpose. Yes, there are causes, some of them your fault perhaps, and some of them not, but those causes are not decisive in determining the meaning of your mess or your pain. What is absolutely decisive is God's purpose. God's purpose is decisive in defining our pain and suffering. That is good news. But the question that comes out of it then, and I think what we have to confront here is, is this a good reason for suffering. When we think about this, if, if God is, has made this man blind from birth to display his glory, and he's now an adult man, he has had a long life of being blind, is that a good reason for somebody to suffer? To answer that, we have to ask if we think God's glory is the ultimate good. Is God's glory the ultimate good that can happen in this world and in this life? And if it is, then displaying his glory is worth the cost no matter what it is. That can be a hard truth. But what I think it does for us is it gives us hope in suffering. Because what it says is that my suffering can be for his glory and his purpose. And so my suffering, my pain now can have a meaning. It can actually have a hope beyond just me trying to get out of it. It can say, God, I don't want to be in this position. And we see the Psalms of lament. It is good to cry out and say, God, I don't want to be in this position, but use it for your glory. And it can, it can redeem that suffering. It can redeem that pain. I think this is what Paul says when he says to live as Christ and to die as gain. To live as Christ, to die as gain. No matter what, God be glory, glorified in my life. Whether I have to suffer, whether I live well, whether I die, I want you to be glorified. And so that's the purpose of this guy's blindness. But then Jesus says that we are invited to be a part of displaying his glory all the time outside of and beyond anything, any suffering in our lives. He says this in verse four. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This we is so exciting. In John five, Jesus said, I work with the father. Now he's saying, we 
all work together with the Father. He is inviting his disciples. He is inviting us into the work that he is doing. He's saying, look, I have answered your theological questions. Now let's get to work. I think of it this way. I think of uh, you're going skydiving and you've got your parachute on, you got everything and you're standing at the door ready to jump. And, and you've got your dive, or, I mean, your jump instructor next to you and you're talking about how the parachute's gonna open. You're talking about how the physics of it's gonna open wide and it's gonna slow your fall. You're talking about the constant of gravity so that you know that you know, it's gonna work so that I'm gonna slowly fall to the earth after this. And on and on and on, you discuss how this is gonna work and Jesus is saying, that's great. I'm glad you understand how this all works. Now get to work, jump, jump and put that knowledge to work. He says here, we have a short time. He says, while it is day, night is coming when we cannot work. Jesus is specifically talking about his time here on earth, but he is telling his disciples that in all of their lives and all of our lives, our time is going to be limited. Death is approaching. We never know how long we have. And he says, get to work, get to work. There is work to do. And he says, I am the light of the world. Once again, we've seen him, we saw him say this in chapter eight. What he's saying is he's saying, I overcome the darkness and I give life through the work. Get to work. And when we work with him, we're able to spread that light to the world and it overcomes darkness and it gives life. And so it is such an amazing picture because Jesus says, this is the truth. We're giving light to the world, get to work. And now I'm gonna give you a picture of what it looks like. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed this man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. There are more instances of blind people being healed in the gospels than of any other miracle. Why? This is a unique miracle that displays the person as God. It is clear from all of the Old Testament that only God can give sight. And so we see it recorded in, in all of the gospels and we see it recorded more than, in any of the, in, than, in, than any other miracle. And the reason is, is because it points to Jesus as God and Messiah. So it is recorded. Isaiah 29, 18 points to this. It says, in that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. Oh, what, what an amazing picture that is. There's some really interesting things that we can draw out of this miracle, but a couple ones I wanna draw your attention to is first of all, Jesus made mud using spit. This has echoes of creation in it, doesn't it? Of him forming us out of the, out of the ground. It's really unclear beyond this why he did it. Some speculate that it was to help the man's faith. I think regardless of the reason was, we can all agree that it's kind of gross. No, I mean, seriously, would you really want somebody to take mud made from spit and smear it on your face, right? It's kind of gross. We don't know why he did it, but the most important thing to realize is that he used one of the most ordinary, basic things to do a miracle. And that is how he works. God chooses to use ordinary means, ordinary things to do his work. He used mud made from the spit of his mouth to do a miracle. And I think that points us to the fact he is going to use ordinary things and people to accomplish extraordinary purposes. He could have said to this man, see, and he didn't. He used an ordinary thing. And I think it is to encourage us in that. The second thing that's really interesting here is that he sends him to a pool called Siloam, which means sent. There's great parallelism in that of Jesus being sent from the Father. I have a map here to show you that this is not right next to each other. Uh, this is, I tried to make some really big arrows so you could see. So you guys see the arrows? Yep. The first one's pointing to the temple gate, which is up, up where the blue arrow is. The second one is the pool of Siloam. And this is a journey that he would have had to make from that point to the next. Someone had to escort this man through the city with mud on his face. What I love about the scene is that Jesus requires two things for this miracle to happen from this man. He requires him to trust him and he requires him to obey. 
This man trusted Jesus by following his instructions without question. Jesus didn't say, go and do this and you're gonna be healed. He just put mud on his face and said, go, go wash. There's always a tie between trust and obedience, between belief and obedience. If you believe, you will obey. We can't separate these two concepts. We demonstrate our belief. We demonstrate our trust through our obedience. Jesus always ties these things together. And I think there's a really important reason beyond the fact that we're demonstrating our faith. It's because it actually strengthens our faith when we do this. When I walk and I obey him, it strengthens my faith in him as the provider because I know it had nothing to do with me. He can do anything he wants to do without my help. But yet he calls us as ordinary beings with ordinary means to accomplish extraordinary purposes. This man had to submit to Jesus. And yet Jesus used the miracle and the public display of it as a part of his plan to bring him glory, as we said earlier. But the other thing to see here is that he did a remarkable work of healing in this man's life. The work that he does in and through him brings him glory. The work that he does in us through our obedience and in our faith always brings him glory and it always points people back to him. And he's inviting us into this. He's inviting us into this at all times. He says, come on, we get to work the works of the Father. So we've seen this miracle. We've seen what happens, uh, what Jesus means by saying he's the light of the world. Now, for the rest of this passage, we're gonna see how people either accept him or they reject him and what that happens with their ability to see spiritual things. So the next number of verses from uh, verse eight to 34 are gonna show how when we reject the light of Jesus, we become blind to spiritual things. So as the beggar leaves the pool, he begins to encounter people. The first group of people he encounters are his neighbors. It says this in verse eight, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. He's like, hey guys, it's me. It's really, really me. But they're not very sure. So why don't they recognize him? I've thought a lot about this. Why don't they recognize him? Perhaps he was just really dirty possibly, right? He was really, really dirty and he went and he took a bath and his hair looked nice now. And they're like, is that really you? You look fine, man. But I don't think that's what's happening here. I think something much, much, much more profound and deep is happening here. I think his transformation was so complete that his posture changed, his countenance changed. Everything about him was transformed. So they looked at him and said, he looks like him, but there's something different about this guy that I'm not so sure it's the same person. This is such a great picture of what happens to us when we come face to face with Jesus. We should become unrecognizable to our neighbors and the people who walked by us every single day. And the way that we live and the way that we act, they should say that doesn't seem to match. So in an attempt to identify him, it's, they begin to ask him some questions. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I, I think it's important to, to point out here, these people's doubt is legitimate. Okay, I don't, I don't think we should cast them off and say, what a bunch of stupid people. They wanna know simply, how did you get your sight? Because I've never seen it happen before. And where's this man so I can ask him about it? They want proof. They wanna see. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I think we cast people from a long time ago and think that, well, they just didn't have the information we did. They just weren't nearly as smart as you and I are. Like we're a lot smarter than they are. But these people doubted miracles. Miracles weren't, it wasn't like everything they saw. It's like, hey, there's food on my table that you just cooked. That's a miracle. I mean, it wasn't, it, everything wasn't a miracle to them. They were very, very skeptical of miracles. And so they want proof. They want to see Jesus. They want to see the person. And when they can't get that, they do what you and I would probably do. They bring in the experts. They say, let's bring him to the experts and see what they have to say. Verse 13, they brought, the, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. 
Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. He's like, come on guys, this isn't that hard. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. This is the first time we learn that this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Jesus got in trouble before for doing miracles on the Sabbath when he healed the invalid and he does it again. It didn't stop him. The Jews had created literally thousands of rules for the Sabbath, 39 categories of work, subcategories of all those things. You, they had how many letters you could write. They had how many steps you could take. They said you can't have nails in your shoes because it's bearing a burden. I mean, it was so minute and specific. And here specifically, they equated what Jesus did to kneading dough. They said, you needed that mud to make it so you worked. And that is a violation of the Sabbath. So the violation of the Sabbath is the very first thing the Pharisees decide to focus on. Not the fact that there is a guy in front of them who can see, who was born blind. They're concerned about the Sabbath. I think I have no doubt that Jesus healed intentionally on this day. He probably walked by this man before but he chose to heal him on the Sabbath. And I think the reason he did was to point us back to the reason for Sabbath and that is rest. And what is rest if it is not healing? Healing from our spiritual and our physical afflictions. That is the Sabbath. And Jesus says, this is the point of the Sabbath. Would you quit missing it? It is for me to heal you of your spiritual and your physical afflictions. It is to give you rest and healing. And so he points them to the Sabbath. But there's another interesting thing here. This miracle was significant enough for some of the Pharisees to say, yeah, I know he violated the Sabbath, but how could a sinner do these things? Because God doesn't listen to righteous people, which is what they would say. He only listens, I mean, God only listens to righteous people. He doesn't listen to sinners. So if this miracle happened, maybe there's something good. So they have division and they do the very last thing you'd expect them to do. They ask the beggar. It's like, we're arguing over this guy, so let's let him decide our dispute. That's, that's just does not seem very like very good logic. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes, he said, he is a prophet. So this beggar's faith is growing. Isn't it? Remember earlier he said the man called Jesus. Now he's saying he's a prophet. He's beginning to grow in his belief about who did this miracle to him. And what this does in their minds is it puts him on par with Elijah and Elisha and all the prophets of the Old Testament. And this is too much for the Pharisees and the Jews to bear. And so they decide, yeah, you're wrong. You're not the man that we think you were. Says the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight. His simple proclamation of Jesus as a prophet changed their minds. They weren't changed for long until they called the parents of the man who had received a sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. So they confirm that their son was born blind, thus putting the controversy to bed of who this man was. So that should really end it all. They should all be like, okay, I guess you're the Messiah because you give people sight. No, that is not what happens. The other thing we see in this section here is how really, truly awesome these parents are. They're like, man, that's our son. But beyond that, we're not going to get behind him. We're not going to go down with him. You ask him. We're not willing to stand behind him. We've seen how they've already abandoned him. We've seen how they were not taking care of him. There's something really deep here going on. And this is, I think, a wound that many of us feel. And that is the feeling like our parents are ashamed of us. These people, these parents were ashamed of their son, period. Because to the world, he was a marker of their sin in their minds. Blindness would have been uniquely associated with a mother's sin during this time. And so it was as if when he, they walked around with their son, it was like a scarlet letter to them of broadcasting to the world, this is my sin, this is my sin. And they were ashamed of their son. And so they had put him at the beggar's gates. 
Not only are they ashamed, but they're scared of the Jews. Verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. There's something serious here. The being cast out of the synagogue was life-threatening. You were excluded from worship and fellowship. The people in the synagogue could not do business with you. They could not come within six feet of you. They had to totally shun you in your life. The parents said, we won't go there for our son. I mean, imagine, imagine the rejection of this beggar. Once again, here he is, as one who has never seen the face of his parents. And he looks on him, hopeful. And they reject him again. Uh, No doubt, he said, maybe they'll see me and they'll accept me now that I no longer represent sin to them. And they reject him again. I think there are two huge things that we see here that ultimately blind people and cause unbelief. The first we see here in the parents, and that is fear. Parents are fearful of losing their status and their community. They don't want to be cast out, and so they're unwilling to explore the truth of who Jesus was, even though their son can see when he was blind. This is a huge barrier for many people. Many people, we don't want to be out of the majority, and so when the majority moves from us, we say, I'm not willing to take that risk. The second thing we see is a pride or a self-trust, and the Pharisees show this over and over and over. Even though they've been given evidence that this miracle actually occurred, they had predetermined that anybody who claimed Jesus the Messiah was to be cast out. They had trusted their own prior assessment of what was going on, and they were not going to look at any new evidence. This is plain and simple pride. This is not truth-seeking. This is seeking confirmation. They are simply looking for confirmation of what they already believe to be true. So what they do is they find the thing in the story that they think will confirm it or discredit what's happening and they latch onto it. You healed on the Sabbath. You're a sinner. In this next part, we're going to see a third thing that blinds people and causes unbelief, and that is control or an unwillingness to submit to God. We get so wrapped up in being in control that we cannot submit. So at this point in the story, the miracle is no longer being questioned. And, as, and so the doubters begin to question the authority of the person who did the miracle. In verse 24, it says, So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Give glory to God is just like a Jewish oath. It says, tell the truth. Tell the truth that God healed you and discard this man named Jesus. Their pride here is really evident. They say, we know, this we here is emphatic. They are making a theological statement that you shouldn't argue with because they are the authorities. They're claiming total knowledge. They have concluded that any other answer is impossible before even looking at the facts. When we do this, when we conclude something is impossible without looking at the facts, we have no chance of coming to the right conclusion. And so it says, he answered. That's not right, where are we? Verse 25. I'm just going to read it out of my notes. The blind man beggar says, He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. What a perfect response. He doesn't try to get into a theological argument with them. He doesn't try to win the day by saying, I'm smarter than you are. He simply says, this is who I was and this is who I am now. I'm not as smart as you. I don't know the things that you know, but one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Argue with that. This is exactly how we need to think about evangelism. We don't need to go into it thinking about how do I win the argument? I got to have every answer nailed down. I got to be able to win every single argument. Our evangelism is I was blind and now I see. This is what God did to transform my life. I may not be able to answer all your questions. I may still have questions myself, but I know I was changed. 
That is evangelism. This is the gospel. He is the light of the world and he opens our eyes. And that is the truth that we go with. And so they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Right? I mean, this is getting pretty tense, right? This is the third time now they've asked him. It's Im the implication is clear. They don't, they don't like the answer he's giving and they want him to change it. So they keep asking him, putting more pressure on him, giving more uh, weight behind what they're saying. And, and the beggar's response is perfect. He doesn't find it remarkable that he believes in God. What he finds remarkable is the unbelief of the Pharisees. He has shown them an astonishing miracle of healing. And all they want to argue about is where this guy comes from. They won't hear because they don't like what they're hearing. I love the boldness of this guy. It's a blind beggar just a few hours ago. And now he is challenging the authorities and the rulers, the Pharisees, without backing down. This is not a man who was studied in scripture. He may have heard over time, but he has never read the scriptures. He could not study. He was blind from birth. And he is not ashamed to say, look, I can't answer all your questions. I can't beat you in a theological argument, but I can look at Jesus and I can say, I know what this man did for me. This is our testimony. But here's their response. And this is the response oftentimes in our testimonies. And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. They are the keepers of truth. They are the gatekeepers. They are the keepers of Moses' law and you can't get to God without them. And so they want to control that. They want to keep them in that spot. But they were totally blind to this. Moses revealed to Jesus. Moses pointed to Jesus. So by saying that, they're condemning themselves in their unbelief. They are willing to say anything to discredit Jesus at this point. They say, we do not know where he comes from. In chapter seven, they said, you won't know where the Messiah comes from. And the problem with Jesus is we know where he comes from. So which is it? They just want to discredit him. And so the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the, since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This logic is rock solid. He just lays it out for him and you can't argue with him. And so they don't, they just cast him out. So they answered, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us and they cast him out. First, they dismissed the miracle until they couldn't. Then they dismissed the worker of the miracle until they couldn't. And then they just dismissed the man. What a day this was. He wakes up, goes to his normal spot, and he gets his sight given to him. And he goes and he meets people throughout the day and they all don't believe him. Then his parents reject him. And ultimately he gets cast out of the synagogue. He is in a worse position at the end of the day than when he started it. but we get to see a beautiful response by Jesus. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Jesus reappears. Have you noticed he's been gone in this story? Have you noticed he has been gone since the beginning of the story? This man is at the lowest point of his life. This is how Jesus works. When we're at our lowest point, he comes and he finds us. I love this quote by Kenneth Gangle. He says, let us not miss the fact that Jesus looked for the man rather than the other way around. How common our terminology when we talk about finding God or finding Christ, but neither the father nor the son was ever lost. We are lost ones and God finds us. This is such good news. He comes and he finds us. And he asked this man the most important question any of us will ever be asked. He says, do you believe in the son of man? This is one of Jesus' most absolute claims to deity in all of scripture. And this word believe is really important for us to understand. This is more than do you accept the sign that I did for you? Do you, more, do you acknowledge what I, that I come from God? He is saying, will you commit everything in order to follow me? 
The cost to this man to follow Jesus was everything. This is the cost to many today. This is actually the cost and the call to all of us today. Do you, I want to add, do we believe that Jesus Christ is worth going to the Middle East, looking somebody in the face and telling them about Jesus, knowing that if they accept that, they will likely lose their family. They will likely lose their job. They will likely be kicked out of all community and there's a very good chance they will lose their life. Is that worth it? Is it worth it to believe for them? That is the cost that this guy had to face. Do we believe that that's a good call to these people or do we believe it's cruel? If we do not understand the work that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross that we will look at next week, then we will answer that question wrongly. Absolutely, it is worth calling those people out of that. It is an eternity that is at stake. And his answer is beautiful. He says, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You have seen him. Words that would have been meaningless earlier in the day. Jesus reveals himself more clearly as God to this man than he does in, than any other individual in all the scripture. This was a crippled beggar who didn't seek him out. And Jesus says, I'm gonna choose this guy to be the first one to fall down and worship me as God. Do you see the worth and the value that it gives on your life? I don't care who you are. I don't care what position you're in. I don't care how much sin you have. Jesus gives you worth and value. He says, I will come and I will find you in your utter sin And I will say, I will use you for my glory. Come, follow me. It would have been easy for this man to say, I should, you should have left me alone. You should have left me alone. I've lost everything now. But instead he says to God, who is he, sir? And Jesus tells him, it is me. And he says, Lord, I believe. And he worships him. This is the normal response of belief. Worship, submission, obedience. I believe that when this becomes real to us, casual worship is impossible. We cannot be casual about this. He comes and finds us as blind beggars and he gives us sight. Belief says, God, I commit it all to you. You are Lord of my life. Use me for your glory. And he concludes, he says, Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see your guilt remains. There's a lot to unpack here and we don't have time to do so. But basically, I just want to say this. Jesus says there are two two types of people, those who see and those who are blind. The ones who say we see, the problem is, is they think they can get to God without God helping them. And that is where they fall into sinful pride and they fall into judgment. Let me close with this. Uh, Gaining sight leads to a pretty radical change of perspective. Imagine, imagine seeing for the very first time. All your life, you would have heard words like green and blue and they would have had no meaning to you at all. What color is that? You wouldn't know what your face looked like. Imagine this guy's reaction. I imagine when he washed his face, the very first thing he saw in the pool was the reflection of his own face. That is just like spiritual sight that we receive. When he opens our eyes, we're able to see ourselves and our great need for a savior for the very first time. We all of a sudden understand words like hope and love and faith and peace and joy. And we understand what it means to take up your cross. We understand what it means to deny ourselves. We understand what it means to submit to him. Worship defines us. Submission ceases to scare us. Trust is what we covet so that we can know God more. I imagine this was very disorienting for this man to receive his sight. And faith is like that sometimes. It disorients us. But as we we see it more, as we know it more, we begin to thirst after it. We begin to hunger for it and say, God, this is worth everything in my life. Use me for your glory. And so the questions we all must answer are the questions he did. Is the miracle real? 
Next week, we have to answer that question. Is the miracle of the resurrection real? And if it is, what does it say about the guy who did it? It says he's God. And if he's God, he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our submission. He is worthy of everything. He will open our eyes. And there will never be a day when we stand before our Father in heaven and say, I cannot believe I gave it up for you. We'll fall down and worship. Let me invite the worship team to come back up and the prayer team to the sides. As we enter into worship and our response to him, God, let us respond and worship and belief in you and obey as you call us.